Yes, he did. Aren't you thankful for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? We do want to welcome you to worship at First Baptist Wentzville. We're glad that you're with us this morning. Let's continue to worship the Lord together. tries to roll over my bones when sorrows come to steal the joy I own when brokenness and pain is all I know oh I won't be shaken no I won't be shaken cause my fear doesn't stand a chance when Stand in your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. 
strength of my soul your love defends me your love defends me and when i feel like i'm all alone your love defends me your love defends me surely this morning and turn to Matthew chapter 22, Matthew 22. We're going to be broaching a subject this morning. Some people wouldn't want to touch with a 10-foot pole. They kind of see it as a sore spot when they discuss it. Uh, for some people, it's like a hot potato. But the Bible speaks directly to this particular issue this morning about God and government and how we relate to God and how we relate to government and how God relates to the government. And so we're going to broach that subject this morning here in Matthew 22. You might recall the last presidential election and what it was like. Uh, there was quite a bit of acrimony even among believers about who should believers vote for or who should believers not vote for or whether or not believers should vote at all. I heard Dr. Moeller, Al Moeller, president of Southern Baptist Theological Seminary on a program the other night and he was indicating that the last election, he didn't vote for anybody. He didn't feel like he could. But this election, he has kind of changed his thinking. He goes, he's going to vote for the person with the most godlike policies and principles because he sees how important that is, the impact it has upon the nation. And so you might even be a little bit uncomfortable right now with what I've been saying, but I am an equal opportunity pastor. You might be thinking, you know, well, whose side is he going to line up on, and who is he going to try to be very careful not to offend? But I, I treat everybody the same. I'm very thankful I have the Word of God to go to, and the Word of God gives us the instructions that we need. But I'll give you a, a story if you're a Democrat. This story is for you if you're a Democrat. I'm sure we have Republicans, Democrats, Libertarians, Independents. I doubt if we would have too many Socialists or Communists uh, uh, watching or in our congregation, but uh, well, this is for the Democrats. Uh, there was a teacher in the Midwest, first grade teacher, and after the president was elected, she came to school and she said, isn't it great that we've had a Republican that's been elected president of the United States? She says, you know, I'm, the, I'm a Republican and I'm so happy about it. She lived in a part of the country where uh, there were a lot of Republicans, and she just said, how many of you kids here in the class are Republicans? And everybody raised their hand except one little girl and she went over to the little girl and says Mary are you not a Republican and she says no I'm not I'm a Democrat and I am proud of it and so she uh, asked her well, what why are you a Democrat and she said well my mama and my papa they're Democrats and so I'm a Democrat and so the teacher said uh, well just because your mama and papa are Democrats, I mean, imagine that your mama was a criminal and your daddy was a criminal, then what would you be? And she said, that's silly, teacher, then I'd be a Republican. <laughs> and so there you go, there's one for you if you're a Democrat. Then I have one for you if you're a Republican. There was this guy came out in his yard. His neighbors were always out about the same time getting ready to cut the grass and water the lawn and, you know, uh, sweep up the driveway. and. Their family was out. They had a little girl, and he'd often talk with her. And 
he just started a conversation and they started talking then he said uh, you know what do you want to be when you grow up and she said well I want to be the president of the United States and her Democratic parents they were so pleased and they were just beaming and so he asked her well uh, what do you want to do when you get in office she said well I want to give free food to the poor and give free housing to all the homeless and he said wow that's quite an agenda that's something really worthy to work towards he said you know you can do that now if you want to and she said well what do you mean he says well you can cut my grass for me and you can water my lawn and you can get all the weeds out of the garden and pull them all pull all the weeds out of the backyard if you'll sweep the back porch and the front porch and the driveway I'll give you a hundred dollars and you can take that hundred dollars and you can go down to the grocery store where the homeless guy hangs out and you can give that hundred dollars to him and he can use it for food and for housing and so uh, the young lady thought for just a minute and she said well why don't we just go down there and get the homeless person and he can cut the grass and he can water the yard and then, then you can give him a hundred dollars and he said honey you've just become a Republican and so I don't think her mom and dad are talking to him yet and so we find in this scripture I know it's dangerous territory but God gives us kind of an understanding of how we're supposed to relate to him and how we're supposed to relate to the government and how the government and God fit together and he's going to tell us in this passage four particular principles ideals keys something that can bring us together that we all can agree on in this political season you can begin reading with me in chapter 22 in verse 15 here we go it says then the Pharisees they went and plotted how to entangle him speaking about Jesus in his words and they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians saying teacher we know that you're true and teach the way of God truthfully and that you don't care about anyone's opinion for you are not swayed by appearances tell us then what you think is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not but Jesus aware of their malice said why put me to the test you hypocrites show me the coin for the tax and they brought him a denarius and Jesus said to them whose likeness and inscription is this and they said Caesar's and then he said to them therefore render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's and so here God begins to work through his son Jesus Christ to kind of teach us uh, how to relate to our government the Herodians and the Pharisees they hated one another and yet they came together because they had a a common goal uh, they hated Jesus more than they hated one another the Herodians they were followers of Herod and so uh, since they were with him they were kind of favorable to the government because he was a puppet of the government and they got a lot of, of uh, good places to work and a lot of benefits from the government so they were government people of course uh, the Pharisees they're religious people and for the Jewish people they hated anybody being over them except God they hated the government and so you take these two together and they come together it's kind of like now in our political situation you have BLM and Antifa and terrorists they might not really get along together that well but they all have a common goal of tearing down the country and making the country into what they want it to be and so that's kind of what was happening here well they thought you know we can trap him by this question and you recognize the question is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar so they're saying look the people of God are they supposed to pay taxes to a government that is pagan idolatrous to an emperor who says that he's a God which of course he's not should believers pay taxes to a government like that and of course Jesus begins to give the answer uh, they couldn't trap him by the question they thought look if he answers yes that you should pay your taxes the religious people they'd be all upset and they would all leave him and then he, they thought well if he says no you shouldn't pay your taxes well then his enemies could go to the authorities and say look 
you better go get Jesus. It looks like he's an insurrectionist. He's saying you shouldn't pay your taxes. But of course, you can't tra trap him. And in one section, he gives us everything that we need to know. You say, well, what do I need to know? What is it that we can come together on, no matter what political party we're a part of? Write down number one. Number one, he teaches us clearly to pay your taxes. Look in verse 18. Let's read it together. But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. They brought him a denarius, and Jesus said, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. He said, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. So, they're a little bit like uh, we are. We hate to pay taxes. We don't like to pay taxes. Uh, most of America, 60%, think the whole tax system ought to be changed. Uh, they rank 13 government institutions from top to bottom, favorable to least favorable, the IRS. They were at the bottom. People think they take too much, much money and they tax too many things. And so it's a very important question for you and for me. Should we pay our taxes? Well, he gives us the answer. He says, give me the denarius. And if you've seen a denarius, it'll have Caesar on one side of the coin. The other side is his mother. She's sitting on the throne. And maybe an homage to her. I don't know why she's on there. But Caesar is on it. And Caesar represents the government. And he's symbolic of the government. They made the coin. They make monetary policy possible because of the coins that they have. There were, was other coinage in that day. But that coin represented the government. And, of course, the government did a lot of things for the people in that day. If you were occupied by them, it's a little bit like America. We occupied Germany and Japan. Uh, though we occupied, we didn't put an American in every little local position to run the systems of what were going on. We just made sure there wasn't any insurrection and anything bad wasn't going to happen. And their own people uh, ran their systems. And same thing with Rome. They occupy and then they let the locals kind of run their government unless they get out of line in some way. And so they made aqueducts now you can still see some of them today. They built highways so people could get to the parts of the world they'd never been to or certainly get around uh, more quickly. They had a military to make peace. It was wonderful for the people under occupation to have peace because those nations, before the Romans conquered them, they fought with one another every four, you know, five, ten years, and they just were in a constant state of war. But Rome, you know, supposedly brought peace to the area. And so there were a lot of things that military just being there uh, cost a lot of money. And so they had to pay taxes. And so Jesus says, look, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. And so this tax you need to, to pay is for all the stuff that they provide for you. And I know that there's maybe higher taxes than you like. And maybe it goes to some stuff that you don't like. But you need to uh, pay your taxes. Of course, that helps us with our thinking about taxes. Maybe we should spend a little more time remembering the good things that we receive from our government when we pay our taxes, whether it be water or sewage or, you know, first responders or police or the military, defense, our court systems. I mean, there are a lot of good things that we receive from paying our taxes. Uh, well, Paul, he wants to clarify the issue even more. He says, when you think about it, let me just give you an idea of how you're supposed to look at the government. So you can turn to Romans 13 with me, if you would. Romans chapter 13, we're going to read verse 4. When you read verse 1, you find out he's talking about that we should be obedient to those in authority over us. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. And when he gets to verse 4, he says, this is what your rulers are like. For he, the ruler, is God's servant for your good. This is how God looks at it. This is how we should look at it. If you do wrong, you ought to be afraid because he doesn't bear the sword in vain. He is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection. So God makes it clear the way that we should look at the government, his view of government, is that it is a servant of God. And the idea is for it to protect us from enemies and to protect uh, our nation so that it might be safe. And uh, that's why this election is so important for you and for me, is that we continue to have a government that uh, gives us law and order in our day and our land. So in our homeland, we can engage life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness in our lives. 
so it only follows. If Jesus tells them that they should pay their taxes, just like you should pay your tithe, and you don't pay your taxes, just like if you didn't pay your tithe, you're cheating God. Because God is the one who gives us this instruction. And I think all of us can agree from what the Bible says is that we should pay our taxes. Even if we don't like it, even if we don't enjoy it, uh, we have learned throughout the years. I, I have to admit I'm one of the first people that think they tax too much and they tax too many things. But you learn throughout the years that it's a, a, a good time to be grateful for being able to live in America where we can be taxed. I mean, there are millions of people that would like to be able to live here and have the privilege, and they wouldn't mind paying taxes at all. Not everybody appreciates uh, what we have here, and we should appreciate it more. Uh, there were a couple of guys, look, you just put in the political parties, I'll just give you a blank. You can put in Democrat, Republican, Libertarian, I'm not going to name them. Uh, you can just put it in. So Mr. Blank and Mr. Blank, they're, rocking, they're walking down the seashore, and they see a bottle and they pick it up and they pull the cork out and a genie comes out. And the genie says, well, both of you have a wish. Uh, there's one wish you can have and you can have anything that you want. And so he said, sir, uh, what would you like? And so Mr. Blank, whoever it is in your, in your mind, he says, well, i just like for me and my friends to be able to live life and to live it under the form of government that we want. And poof, all of a sudden they found themselves in Venezuela. And so he turned to the next guy, Mr. Blank, whoever you think it is, and he said to him, well, now you get a wish. Uh, what do you want? What is it that you desire? And he said, well, let me get this right. All of the blanks, they're not here anymore, and they're all in Venezuela. And he says, well, yes, that's right. He says, you know what? I think I have a big old Pepsi. <laughs> and so some people don't appreciate our nation but we should appreciate our nation and whatever God says about it we should pay our taxes gratefully honestly even if we can't do it you know joyfully because that's what the Bible teaches right down number two one thing we can all agree on the Bible teaches we should pay our taxes but also that we should pray have you been watching TV lately and maybe you've been thinking uh, can't we have a little bit of peace and quiet in America for a change? Have you ever found yourself yelling at the TV, which you shouldn't be doing, but yelling at the TV, can't we all just get along? Somebody ought to give me an amen out there for that. Well, listen, if you want to be able to help our nation to have that to happen, then prayer is going to be a big part of your life because Paul instructs us on that. Turn to 1 Timothy. It's just to your right, just a little ways. And turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2, if you would. 1 Timothy, and look in chapter 2, and here's what he says. Here's how you can help our nation. Good application verse. It says, first of all, 1 Timothy 2, 1, first of all then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life godly and dignified in every way doesn't that sound good don't you think just in general it'd be a nicer place to live if people live peaceful and quiet lives godly and dignified in every way well a way for you to help that to happen is to pray for your leaders and you want to notice that he says in order for that to happen, that we may lead lives like that, first of all, it's not second, it's not third, it's not fourth. If you're like me, I plead guilty. I probably have complained more about the government in the past than pray for the government or pray for the leaders in government. Maybe that's a part of the problem. Maybe that needs to be switched around. Maybe I need to pray for our leaders, then we'd have better leaders. Maybe I need to pray about our policies, and then we'd have better policies. Maybe I should pray for a better people in the government, and we'd have better people in the government. I don't know how much time you spend praying, but just try to figure out how much time you spend complaining. How's that working for you? And if you spend a couple of hours complaining, maybe you ought to spend maybe two and a half hours praying for those people. 
you say, well, you know, I didn't vote for those leaders. You know, I don't particularly like those leaders. I certainly don't support their positions. You'll be glad to find out that the Lord never said that you have to be able to do that before you can pray. He didn't say you had to vote for them. He didn't say you had to like them. He didn't say you had to support them. He said, you know what you couldn't, can do? You can pray for them. So maybe, I don't know, just an idea, pick out the politician that bothers you the most, and maybe you should pray for them the most. And maybe, in answer to your prayers, they might change, and they might be a different person, would help make our country a different country. And so we can all agree on that, that we should pray for our leaders, and we should do that more than complain, because we shouldn't be complaining at all. Pay your taxes, pray for your leaders. Write down number three. The Bible teaches us we should get involved. Go back to Matthew 22. Matthew 22. Uh, you can read it again with me, verse 20, 21. Get involved in your government. It says this, Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Render the things that are his to him. And to God the things that are God's. So, since Caesar being on the coin represented the government, you're supposed to give to the government the things that go to the government. And we've already seen a couple of those, taxes and prayer. That should be something we give to the government. But also we should get involved because we have a government and we have a government that's set up that it's a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. And so if you don't participate in the government, you're directly contradicting what God commands us to do. You're living a life of disobedience. So that means... We should, first of all, select people who are in our government, in positions. We should select the best available people that we have that reflect uh, the kingdom of God. Uh, we have this responsibility to do that. Now, in America, I think most people get this. You're not going to be able to pick somebody who's perfect. Uh, we know we're all broken. We live in a broken world. We live in a broken America. Everybody fails. Everybody misspeaks. Everybody says the wrong thing. You're not going to find anybody perfect to vote for. But you need to find somebody who will uh, have as their policies and their principles those derived from the Word of God. Now, our country knew that, so we set our country up uniquely. It's why it's been a great nation and will continue to be one, we pray. But we have three branches of government because of that. And it's checks and balances. So we have the president, we have the executive branch, we have a legislator, uh, legislative branch, we have a judicial branch. And we have three branches because they keep uh, one of the branches from being all-powerful because they knew that people, if they become all-powerful, dictator, uh, uh, tyrannical, that they will use that power for themselves and not for the people. So we have checks and balances. Well, we need people uh, who are wise to be the people who legislate so that we have good policies and good laws. We need people who have good knowledge and have wisdom that can adjudicate in our judicial systems. And we need somebody who is conscientious about the people, that really does care about the people. And he believes that's what he's doing is working for the people and that would be in the office of the president to help uh, propagate uh, laws, uh, effectuate laws, and uh, also uh, policies that he might effectuate for the good of the people. That's what we have in our go government system, and that's what we uh, need to continue to have in our, center, uh, our, our country. I'm going to do something I don't normally do, but I'm going to tell you how I'm going to vote this year. It's probably not going to be what you think. Because I'm going to vote the same way I vote every year. And here's the way I vote. I don't vote for the party. I don't vote for just the person. I vote for the policies that they're, they say they're going to enact. I look at their record on what they have done. And then I'm going to look at the principles behind the policies that they have. And I'm going to vote for the person that more reflects the kingdom of God. Because, after all, we'll find later, there is a restriction on government placed by God himself. So, I'm not a dyed-in-the-wool Democrat. I'm not a dyed-in-the-wool uh, Republican. 
I'm not a dyed-in-the-wool libertarian. I am a dyed-in-the-wool Jesus follower. And since I follow Jesus, I want to have people in office who reflect the truth and who reflect the good things of God. Some people say, well, my vote doesn't count that much. You just read this carefully because it counts to God. It's a responsibility we have as well as a privilege. But I'll say this, it's a, a responsibility that we should use responsibly. You shouldn't just go in and make marks and not know what you're doing. You ought to do your research and no matter who you're going to vote for and line it up with the Word of God. That brings to number two of what you can do. You, you need to run for office. We need to have godly people uh, run for office. Uh, they need to give their lives to public service. I know that some people think there's supposed to be a separation between God and government. You won't find that in the Constitution anywhere. And you won't find that in the Scripture anywhere. Jesus was very much involved with the Sanhedrin, the local government. They legislated. They enforced laws. They had a high priest, a president that they elected. So he was very much involved with the government. It, there are many occasions where he told them, look, you're doing this wrong. So we, I think we all can agree that we all should fully participate in the government. Write down number four. We should stand up for what is right. Look, go to verse 16 of chapter 22, and let me remind you of what it said. You know, they didn't want to go. They sent their, their disciples, the Pharisees, along with the Herodians. And they said, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully, and that you don't care about anyone's opinion, for you're not swayed by appearances. So then answer this question for us. Well, you know, they weren't being real. They weren't really praising him. They hated him. And they hated everything that he stood for. So they gave him flattery. Flattery is what you say to somebody to their face, but that's not how you talk about them behind their back. Praise is something you'll say behind somebody's back. It doesn't matter if you say it to their face or not. You'll give them praise. Well, these guys are full of flattery, but the Lord, he knew it. He says, I'm aware of your malice. But they did say something that was true that Jesus speaks the truth and he was going to speak the truth whether it was a politician or somebody who was religious uh, no doubt he was going to speak the truth and so when you join a church or you're a member of a church in our congregation you never want the church you attend the local body of believers to ride on the back of the donkey or the elephant because we are a free people before God to tell someone if they are doing something morally wrong, immoral, or doing something that spiritually is not right, it is our responsibility and our privilege to stand up and to speak the truth. Then we call them to repentance, and then we call them to get right with God. That's what we do. And uh, it's always been that way uh, in uh, history. We should go on our knees and pray about our government and pray for our leaders. And then we should stand up on our feet. And we should not be afraid to tell them what is right and what is wrong. Uh, Nathan did it with David. Uh, you find Elijah did it with Ahab. Eleazar, he did it with Jehoshaphat. You have Daniel, he did it with Nebuchadnezzar. You have Moses... And, you know, he did it with Pharaoh. They told them and they warned them that what they were doing, it was wrong for them to do. And so it's okay for us to say that this moral wrong will never be politically correct. And you might think, well, can you give me an example of that? Well, I can. Abortion. It will never be right in the eyes of God. Never. That will never, ever be politically correct. Correct. So you research the scriptures. We stand up and we speak for the truth. We'll say, where did you get an idea like that? Right here in verse 21. And then you see what it said? Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. First time in history, God has a revolutionary idea. Everything doesn't belong to Caesar. <laughs> Not everyone belongs to Caesar. You don't have to give everything to Caesar. Of course, Christ being 
God is brilliant. He uses an image of Caesar. Of course, you know how he describes our creation, that we are made in the image of God. And we belong to God. And we are his. And we don't belong to Caesar. So that first half of that verse says, here are the rights of the government. And then the second half of the verse, here are the restrictions to the government. Not everything belongs to the government. Now, we know some of the things. Pay your taxes. Pray for them. Uh, get involved. Uh, stand up and tell the truth. To you. All those things, those belong to the government. What belongs to God? Well, everything belongs to God. Uh, who belongs to God? Well, everybody belongs to God. For he is our creator. And so here's the deal. We can agree that we should pay our taxes, that we should pray. We can agree that we should get involved. We can agree that is a responsibility we have to stand up and to speak the truth. But the reality is, even with all of that, there are some things the government can't do for you. They cannot save your soul from going to hell and having eternal life. They can't give you a peace that passes understanding. Uh, the government can't heal your family. Uh, the government can't heal, heal the sorrows of your heart and in your life. Now, the government can't give you the direction on how to live because they can't define what is right and wrong. That only happens through God and through his son, Jesus Christ. And what Jesus Christ did was come to this earth to have the government upon his shoulders to hold it up. One day he's coming again, and he died on the cross for your sins that you might have eternal life. And I would say to you this morning, there are a lot of things that you can do in relation to your government, but more important than that is what you do with Jesus Christ. And I would say to you that you need him to forgive your sins and to save your soul and to give you everlasting life. The government can't do that for you. I would encourage you to follow him and to live for him because they can't give you the peace and purpose that you need for living. You'll come to the end of the game and not have what you've always desired and wanted. I would say follow uh, the Lord and Savior. Jesus Christ and if you want to have something that means something if you want to make a difference in the world instead of burning everything down you could build everybody up for every heart that is changed through the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ will be a change in our world for the better you know how to relate to government now but now you remember that we only rely upon Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. And whenever we thank you for your word, it just reveals to us things that we don't know. And we're grateful to understand what you say about the government, how we should pay our taxes, how we should pray for our leaders, how we should get involved in our government, how we should be willing to stand up and speak the truth when somebody's doing something uh, wrong. And I would pray this morning that somebody has realized through this whole scripture that they need Jesus more than they've ever needed him in their life. They realize that they're lost. They realize that they're wayward. And they realized how futile it is to depend on the government or anyone else to provide for them the things that only you can provide for them. So I pray this morning they might be saved, that they might humbly come to you and receive you as the, their Lord and Savior, that they not be afraid. They can come to you just like they are. That's how we all come and they can receive the forgiveness they need, and they can re receive life. And you know what? Then they'll know how to live, and then they'll know how to give life to others. We pray it in your name. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.
from wherever you've been. Come broken heart, let rescue begin. Come find your mercy, oh sinner, come near. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can hear. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can hear. So lay down your excited that on October 11th everyone gets to come back not only to worship but to Sunday school. How is that going to look? When you come in the door, no more temperature taking. 
We do ask that you wear a mask anytime that you're in the hallways or going to and from a class or worship. When you come in, no more advanced seating. You just come into the sanctuary, find your location, and make sure that there's three spaces between you and the next family. If you decide to go to Sunday school, we encourage that, and we ask that you wear your mask on your way to Sunday school, and when you get there, we're gonna also have social distance Sunday school classes. We are so excited to see you this coming Sunday. go to our website and check out just uh, all that we're doing as we reopen on the 11th and we look forward to doing that I'll remind you we have a women's Bible study and men's Bible study starting on the 18th that Sunday evening so you might want to check that out and sign up for that as well uh, look uh, pray for the president and pray for Melania as we pray for all of those that have uh, COVID-19 uh, and then pray about your vote and I pray that it's very, very important, uh, this vote. It's very, very important to God that you vote. And then you pray and do what God wants you to do. And then we'll just trust him with everything else in our lives. Let's pray together and we'll be dismissed. Father, you have been so very good to us and blessed us and blessed our nation. And sometimes we have neglected just how great we have it here. And we don't want it to be that way anymore. We want to be mindful of what you have provided and our responsibility of being able to pass it off to our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren so that they can enjoy the freedoms and the lives that we have been able to enjoy here in our nation. So give us wisdom, give us direction. We know you hold the whole world in your hands and we're so grateful that that includes uh, us as well. Uh, we thank you, Lord. We pray it with respect and appreciation in your name. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Ready? Break. Right.